Now it might be surprising from my past videos, what with the overabundance of Nintendo related content, but when I was younger I never really got into the Xbox's extensive game library. I played a bit of multiplayer here and there with my brother, but not much outside of being ground into dust on Halo 2's coagulation map. Naturally, this means that I missed out on a ton of great games, and recently I've been going through Microsoft's library of classic titles to see just what I missed out on. And today, we're taking a look at the science behind one of these classic Xbox franchises. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of The Science Of, the show where I take a look at the science behind your favourite game shows and more. Today, we're diving into 2K games to look at the science behind the subnautical adventures experienced in Bioshock. Bioshock was developed and published by 2K Games in 2007, and takes place in a fictionalised version of the 1960s, where a plane crash causes a lone survivor to discover the world of Rapture, a massive underwater city constructed by the business magnate Andrew Ryan. This horror themed action adventure game allows the player to explore the underwater dystopia of Rapture, where the player is urged to turn anything and everything into a weapon. This also includes the player turning themselves into a living weapon, genetically engineering themselves to produce incredible powers. Today, we're going to take a look at the science behind Bioshock's Adam, a chemical substance that's used to produce a serum known as plasmids, which can go on to rewrite genetic material. As with any game, this tempering with genetic coding does not result in some kind of Cronenberg monster, but instead results in the player gaining exciting new abilities that allow them to tear through wave after wave of enemies, such as the Electrobolt Plasmid, which sends a jolt of electrical energy to electrocute opponents, or provide power to locked doors fan throughout the city. Now, quick spoiler alert, none of these skills are possible in the real world, with DNA changes more often than not resulting in illnesses rather than superpowers. But the use of plasmids in the game is surprisingly similar to their use in the real world in research studies, where plasmids are able to influence genetic material in a far subtler way. In cytology, the study of cells and cellular organisms, a plasmid is a small loop of double-stranded DNA that exists inside bacterial cells. Often genes carried in plasmids provide bacteria with genetic advantages such as antibiotic resistance and have a wide range of lems, from roughly 1,000 DNA base pairs to as many as hundreds of thousands. Scientists have taken advantage of plasmids as a tool to clone, transfer and manipulate genes. Plasmids used for these purposes are generally called vectors, and today we're going to take a look at how these vectors can manipulate DNA today. Lentiviral vectors are formed from a HIV type 1 retrovirus that can infect both dividing and non-dividing cells owing to their viral shell. This viral shell is able to get them through the intact membrane of the nucleus of a target cell. Lentiviruses are unique as they're the only type of virus to have two strands of RNA and as such they contain two single-stranded positive sense RNA genomes that are around 10 kilobases long. These are each flanked by long terminal repeat regions that don't code for anything and mainly act to protect the coding regions in the center. To obtain a lentiviral gene therapy vector, you start by taking a reporter gene and cloning it into a vector sequence that's flanked by long terminal repeats and a size sequence of HIV. The long terminal repeats are necessary to integrate the therapeutic gene into the genome of the target cell, just as long as the long terminal repeats in the HIV integrate double-stranded DNA copy of the virus into the host chromosome. Lentiviral vectors are normally created in a transient transfection system in which a cell line is transfected by three separate plasmid expression systems. First of these is a transfer vector plasmid, and these contain cis-acting genetic sequences that are necessary for the vector to infect the target cell and for the transfer of the therapeutic gene. It also contains restriction sites for the insertion of the desired gene. After this we have the packaging plasmid. This is the backbone of the virus system and within it are found the elements required for vector packaging, such as structural protein genes, HIV genes and genes that code for enzymes that generate vector particles. It also contains the human cytomegalovirus which is responsible for the expression of the virus protein during translocation. Finally, we have the third plasmid's envelope gene of a different virus. This is incredibly important as it specifies what type of cell to target and infect instead of T cells. Normally HIV can only infect helper T cells because they use their GP120 protein to bind to a CD4 plus receptor. However, it's possible to genetically exchange the CD4 receptor binding protein for another protein that codes for a different cell type on which gene therapy will be performed. This gives the HIV lentiviral vector an incredibly broad range of possible target cells. 
These free plasmid components of the vector are placed into a packaging cell, which is then inserted into the HIV shell. So we know what lentiviral vectors are made of, but how do they actually work? Well, as mentioned earlier, lentiviruses are the only type of virus that are diploid, meaning that they contain two strands of RNA. This RNA genome is approximately 10 kilobases long, with ends flanked by long terminal repeats, and a size sequence that's found near the five end of the genome. This is necessary for the packaging of the viral RNA into virus caspids to continue to infect the host with HIV. However, the HIV's genetic information is integrated into the host cell as DNA, and as such, the RNA needs to be converted into DNA inside of the host for viral replication to be successful. This is done by the reverse transcription of RNA. The enzyme reverse transcriptase synthesizes the first strand of DNA from an RNA template, and then the host DNA polymerase synthesizes a second strand to produce the double-stranded DNA. The double-stranded DNA copy that's just been created will then be inserted by the enzyme integrase into the host genome. But this brings up the question, what stops the body from rejecting this non-self DNA? Well, that's down to the long terminal repeat sequences, which act as part of the promoter region for the transcription of viral genes, protecting them from an attack by the host's immune system. It's this property of the HIV virus to integrate its genetic material into the host that makes it so attractive for scientists wanting to explore gene therapy, as these vectors have been found to not trigger any kind of reaction from the immune system. With the new genes from the HIV vector DNA copy, duplication, excision and integration of the virus can take place. After the infection and integration of the virus into its host, regulatory proteins let the retroviral DNA exist in three stages, the first of which is a latent period of inactivity, followed by a stage where the virus starts to infect T helper cells or whatever cell their target molecule will bind to, and finally the rapid production of ineffective viral particles that are released into the blood once the host cell dies and undergoes cell lysis. This is a pretty sensitive part of the treatment, as the researchers need to ensure that the HIV infection isn't passed on to the patient. But as I said all the way back in my video on the science of Spider-Man, in order to get any kind of powers from this kind of genetic alteration, you can't just change one gene. The world of genetics is so complex that you would need to target tens or hundreds of gene loci throughout your genome to get any kind of powers. And even then, you never know whatever genes could mask their expression, so all in all, it is a bit of a pain. And even then, some of these powers wouldn't need genetic changes. Insect Swarm, the ability which allows you to summon a swarm of killer bees, can be achieved through the alarm pheromone called 2-methyl-3-butene-2-ol, which is released on the killing of the European hornets. This causes nearby hornets to attack threats in an attempt to deter predators from killing further hornets. But there is one interesting factor mentioned in Bioshock, and it's the use of Adam to support potent stem cells, that acts in a similar way to cancerous tissue. Whilst in gene therapy, doctors use vectors to transfer corrective genes into a patient's cells, they are also capable of stitching themselves into the middle of a cell's genome. This can cause issues with the cell's replication cycle and its stringent cell checkpoints, which in turn can cause the cell to mutate and become cancerous. However, the events of the game take place over a pretty short amount of time. Though, of course, being underwater, we never really get a great feel of time as accurately as we would above ground. During this time, the carcinogenic impact of the atom is unlikely to be observed. It's much more likely to appear in the far-off future, once all the little sisters have grown up, got jobs, and bunged old Jack in an old folks home, where he'd probably still be to this day. So there we go. When it comes to Bioshock's plasmid, it would need to feature a ton of genes for it to have any chance of manipulating the human genome in a significant way. And it's amazing that they don't just mess up the player's body beyond repair. There's more science behind the first Bioshock that I don't have time to cover in this video, so look out for a video in the future where I take a look at the impact that living in an underwater city would have upon people and their health, as well as the kind of pressures these structures would be under. And Rapture wasn't the only interesting Bioshock location. In Bioshock Infinite, they introduced the floating city of Columbia, and there's a whole load of science hidden in there that I'd love to explore at another time. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help combat the ever-changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm, then make sure you share the video to help my channel grow. If you have any scientific subjects or topics that you'd like to see me cover in the future, then please tell me in the comments down below. As well as that, follow me on Twitter to get updates on the latest science of videos, and join my Discord for chats about science, gaming, and more. 
But until then, this has been the Science of Bioshock. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for game based content, then you can join me over on Twitch, where I livestream three times a week playing all manner of games suggested by the community. Or if you want to support the channel even further, then you could also contribute to my Patreon, where you'll get behind the scenes access to the creation of all videos, as well as being able to vote on what the next science of video will be.